So hopefully you know why we're here, having an event for neighbors. <clears throat> Thanks, Ben and Hilson around for hosting us. Before we talk about uh, we talk about neighbors, very quickly about SIPSA, our PhD. You might know, as you might not, we are in just group of SIPSA. We're focusing on energy modeling. Uh, either I'm trying to do the same thing as the first time. Admit people on the top. Um, so we are doing energy modeling with the CFT. Uh, every year we host the SIPSA Building Simulation Awards. Very successful running for many, many years up to now. Um, not gonna work, is it? Um, uh, so we have the um, submission deadline on the 27th of August. We have two different categories. One is for the best project of the year. So any specific person or groups of people or teams can actually submit the work. Uh, we also have what we call a young model award. So we actually invite young people to submit themselves as the best uh, model of the year. So please, please, please submit uh, your entries. The, yeah, the um, event, actually the presentation, the finalist who's going to win and so on, are going to be presented as part of the Build to Perform uh, on the film server. So please join the event as well. So today, thinking about neighbors, uh, we have a very, very good and lovely panel. If this is all of the order, we have Claire here, we have Hugh, Darren, and Owen. Um, so we have um, Claire and Hugh from the IDR, the Independent Design Review Panel. We have Darren, who has been instrumental in sort of introducing neighbors to the, to the UK. And also on the IDR panel. Yeah. As well, yes. And also providing the training. And well, yes, also doing <laughs> And we have Owen who is um, talking to us through a model's perspective. So he has been done a lot of work on neighbors the last two years. Four years. Um, so that's it. Uh, in terms of agenda and how it's going to uh, run, we're going to start with Darren, uh, talking about neighbors very quickly, why it is, how it started, and where it's going. Then we're going to I uh, talk about uh, the model's perspective. So Owen is going to give him some tips, and then a real life case study. And then we're going to talk. Uh, we're going to talk about the um, kind of the ideas uh, perspective. So people, um, and then we have Darren again talking us about the uh, further updates and the next steps of of neighbors, and then hopefully some time for Q and A. Does this sound all good? Yes. Good. <coughs> Did you want to sit here and admit people? Yes. I, love it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have to worry about doing that. Yeah. Great. Super. Uh, yes. So I'm Darren Coppins, uh, and my company is called Built Physics, and I've been involved with uh, bringing neighbors to the UK since about 2017. So I think the journey started well before then. So I think everyone here and on the call probably knows what Neighbours is. That's why you're here today, but just as a brief introduction about what it's about, I think we can just do a quick recap so that we're all uh, brought up to the same level. So Neighbours um, is a product of um, Australia, um, same as uh, similar called Neighbours uh, from Australia. Um, that's probably uh, created uh, a little bit before this one. It's the National Australian Built Environment Rating System. And in Australia, it covers more than just energy. It also looks at water, um, habitat and well-being, other things uh, around um, buildings. It's been around for 24 years uh, in New South Wales, and it rates buildings on star ratings one to six. Um, it's based on actual energy consumption. So this is an in-use rating scheme. It's not a design tool. It's an in-use rating scheme you get your building, doesn't matter what age it is, whether it's new, whether it's been around for 100 plus years, um, you have a neighbours rating, you get your star rating, you get a feel for how your building is actually performing factored to uh, how the building is actually being used. So you get a good uh, feel for its energy use compared to how you're using it. So it also gives you an idea of how you can improve it, how you can introduce metering to help you understand where your energy is going, 
Um, and in Australia, um, the reason why we're interested in it is it's had quite a market transformation. So between 2002 and sort of 2018, um, the market in Australia has reduced their energy use in buildings considerably because it allows them to understand where their energy use is and it allows them to actually pull their energy use back and uh, get it into line with how their building should be performing. So 84% of applicable buildings in Australia now do neighbours um, and is considered one of the world's leading rating systems in terms of its outcomes. So how did it get to the UK? Well, it's an initiative that was led by the Better Buildings Partnership uh, quite some time ago. Sarah Ratcliffe uh, and all her passion uh, helped to get the team together, the funders, the, the project needs supporters, um, and people like me who helped with the early pilot studies to actually see if we could apply to the UK. And it was all generally very positive. Um, I was involved in it from about 2017 when I was asked to do um, one of the pilot models, um, which I chose to do on an existing building, whereas a lot of others did it on new buildings. So that actually then once I'd done it blind, I could go and have a look at the energy use. Uh, and that was very telling indeed, because um, one of the early models I did with the controls being very basic, came quite close to how it was actually performing. But then when I put the controls into it that it actually had, it diverged away quite a bit. And we actually found that the controls weren't quite working right in that building. So it started to demonstrate to me that the methodology that you use to model buildings against mm -hmm. neighbours, um, you know, they actually had something going here in terms of the way that um, they apply uh, internal conditions and things to your standard neighbours model, um, started to get closer to actual buildings. Um, so yes, I think that definitely works with my appetite. Um, so in the UK, at the moment, office, it's offices only for neighbours. Um, the base bill, which was launched 2020, is essentially your base building. So all of the tenant HVAC services, uh, so ventilation, heating, cooling, and everything that is involved with the core of the building mm -hmm. uh, and the base build. That includes everything from your access control systems, fire alarms, lighting and everything else as part of that base building, you have to estimate the energy for and even rating as part of that base building. And then tenancy and whole building uh, was launched uh, this year, earlier this year, and there's starting to be quite a bit of interest in tenancy and whole building because there's a lot of occupiers that are driving and keen to perform against neighbours. So it sort of spawned the, the neighbours uh, in Australia and in the UK has spawned the design for performance aspect or modelling and predicting a rating for your new building or your refurbishment. So this is where we come to design for performance. And so design for performance is in some regards separate to neighbours because it is a prediction of how buildings are going to perform. But you can go through the neighbours administrator to obtain a licence to market your building um, to your predicted design rating and you have to do, go through an IDR process for that. So the steps that you would do is you would sign up your project with the administrator. You can promote your target rating um, and then you model the building how it will operate. OK, these are the key steps for design performance. You need to model the building for how it will operate. Ideally, you will model it much earlier than that and carry your neighbours model through into informing the building design. Um, then once you've done that and you've got your model for how the building will operate, not how it could operate, if you did this, that and the other, how it is actually designed to operate, you go for your independent design review, which is what we're here to talk about today. Um, this is where the independent design reviewer, such as uh, myself and my colleagues here, will go through the building in quite a lot of fine detail, not the model, not just simulation reports, but the architectural aspects as well, and engineering. Um, and then once we give that a tick and say that your rating is good, you can fully market your target rating. Okay, so uh, you do it in an RIBA stage four or later, so it needs to be fully detailed. Sometimes if you're doing a performance job, it needs to move on to whoever's doing the, the, the detailed design. HVAC modeling is absolutely essential. You need to do full HVAC modeling really for it to be a compliant model. Um, and you need to do a comprehensive uh, simulation report. That simulation report needs to tell the IDR panellists everything about your building, which I'm sure um, we'll be coming on to shortly. Right, I'll pass you on to uh, a modelist perspective. 
Yes. Hi everyone. Yeah, my name is Owen from Hawley. As you've heard from the introduction, I've been working around neighbours for about four years and um advised early on because I started working on the Pioneer project, which was Timber Square. Um, so ever since then, I've been pretty much working full time on doing neighbours and trying to implement it and trying to do it and refine it. It's become quite quite a journey. Um, so I'm here to give some few tips that I've got that I give to other colleagues um, that come on to the come on to doing neighbours, just to help them guide through the process. Yeah. Oh yeah, this one. There we go. So I've got three slides just to go through, and you can kind of see it aligned to the sort of stage two, three, four kind of um process so the first one is walk before you run is my top tip pretty much so make sure you've got the principles in place whenever i see you know new people come into neighbors they're always quite excited it's like yes i've got neighbors going to do some advanced simulation work and they delve into the hvac model and they throw in some numbers they try to get figures out from MEP engineers and lo and behold you just get the garbage back i don't know what the specification is i'm not really sure what that hump is i don't know what the controls are and you just spend a lot of time, basically wasted time, trying to get a model that's giving you a set of numbers. Is that really doing anything? Are you driving the design in any way, shape or form? So first thing you do is just resist that temptation. Go read the document, make sure you get all the principles in place. There's a lot of weird little rulings in neighbors. It's quite infamous for that. You know, stuff like retail units, making sure that your metering's in place. Catch those bits early on, make sure all the design team know that early on before you go and you fast forward. I've got too many horror stories that states were all trying to squeeze in an extra meter and it doesn't have the space and everyone's up in arms. It is just much nicer to catch that early on. Um, so yeah, make sure you know all the fundamentals. The next thing is, is the architecture should help you. It shouldn't hinder you. Um, you need to, we need to start pushing the architects more. They put up a facade design. We're there, the design, uh, we're there to push them to make sure that we drive down that solar load um, to get properly a decent performing building. And to use a simulation tool like IS or TAP, whatever you sometimes it's too clunky, sometimes too big of a unit to get those quick fire simulation models out there, out there for the architect to use and to comprehend and to take in their design. So look at other tools that might be out there. You know, there's some like um, Energy Plus Grasshopper tools. Anything dynamic just to get out there and say, look, I'm going to run a couple of glazing ratios on a very like small box model just to inform that design. And then you can use Lean on BCO and Letty and other guys just to push that design, get the conversation going, get them to think about the design rather than rather than taking that pressure on yourself trying to get the model working perfectly. Um, and also another thing to add to this, clients will often now at stage two saying, what star rating am I getting? Like, we haven't even got to your plan yet, come down. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, <laughs> resist that to me, yeah. Right, the next one uh, I've titled Challenge Everything. Everything. Any input, any specification, any design feature, question it. Uh, engineers are, are, are lazy. Uh, sorry, they love efficiency. <laughs> um, and they'll copy a previous design and just lump it on this, this new project. Why? Oh, we've done it before, it works, great. It's like, yes, but it's a completely different building. Why have you chosen that supply and temperature? Why is it under 20? Why are you organising your ventilation in a basement like this? You've got a mixture of controlled zones and uncontrolled, unconditioned zones, and yet you're just supplying heating to the whole area. Why is that? If you ever thought about why, most of the time, they don't have an answer. And to be honest, why would they have an answer? They never had to think about it in the past. And this is the key benefit and key, like, Good thing of neighbours is it's getting people to think about their design and what's wasting energy in the building. Um, the next thing is, is make sure you optimise your neighbours model against other project factors. Um, you've got Partel to compete with. You've probably got Brian you know, one credits using a different methodology. You've got a couple of plates to spin. It's trying to make it work for everyone before you get caught. You can normally make it work, but things like enhanced air filtration for well, that's you know normally going to push up the event rate and you want to catch that early on so you don't suddenly at stage three and spot oops sorry we forgot we didn't put the right pressure drop in and suddenly you know, your margin's gone or your modeling margin's gone 
Um, plant sizing is another key one. Uh, different engineering teams do it differently, but I don't think as an industry we're properly thinking about it um, on every single project. I think neighbours is is great for offices, but like how do we expand it further? What bits of neighbours can we take onto a hotel, a school, or residential building? And plant sizing, I think, is definitely one that you know the lessons learned can be spread out. Um, so yeah, make sure that you've got the right sequencing in place. Maybe think about the jockey heat pump just to manage the smaller loads. We've seen so many offices now with like a wellness center or a yoga studio or an event space. They're always going to be running a bit later than your office hours. And yeah, the main plan is going to be servicing those areas. Not the best thing to do. Let's get a smaller unit in there to, to uh, manage those loads. Um, so yeah, always question everything. Absolutely everything. Um, I've had scenarios where MEP teams have copied a design from a previous project and then said, yeah, we'll do this. They didn't realise that that previous project had a dehumidification criteria, but they've just copied it across. Why are you dehumidifying the air? It's not in the design brief. It's just, oh, that's the last neighbours project we did. Again, efficiencies, laziness, <laughs> just always challenge it. Um, the last point, it's unglamorous. But just make sure you have a solid naming convention. I think we can all speak here. You all who do modelling, it's probably you know easier to keep, uh, easy to lose track of PIL models, EPCs. Once you lump in HVAC trials and other iterations and our scenarios, it becomes a mess. So just make sure you fix that early doors uh, before moving on. Oh, that's nice. There we go. The uh, last one is don't fear the idea. I mean, look at them. They're not, a, <laughs> not a scary bunch. Um, embrace it effectively because they, they're not there to criticise you. They just want your building to perform the best it can be. There might be certain things that could be improved. They just want that incorporated in the design or things that you know, may lead to a high risk. Brought into the specification board and design so you get the end product that you want. They're not there to criticise you. They're not there to say you did this wrong. That's the wrong approach. I mean, sometimes it depends on the quality of the report, which they'll come on to. Um, but if you follow the rules and like, follow the rules and read the simulation report, the draft, the example simulation report that they have, if it all aligns to that. You've stated your specificity, your, your risks and assumptions, then you've got nothing to fear. Um, so one note, so Darren mentioned earlier that it's normally undertaken, the idea is normally undertaken at stage four. So we've done that in the past, and what normally happens is just try to get it started at stage four, probably starts midway through stage four, takes a bit of time to get the review going, gets time to get all the information from the design team. The point there is not just us, you need architectural, you need MEP, you need the client's rating achievement plan, you might need a fit out guide, you need all these different factors lumped in together. Um, so it might drift, and then you start your stage four, and we've had it. An RDR commence when stage four is finished. And yet the design team's not really working on it anymore. And you try to implement all these comments in the reviews, and you're just playing, you're just fighting a losing battle, uh, in my in my experience. So what you can do, I mean it's not fixed, you don't have to do one. You know, you can do a two-stage IDR, which I normally recommend. You do one at the end of stage three, just buy yourself time to incorporate the comments um, in stage four when you're working through the design. It obviously costs a bit more, but you can raise that with a client. You get a better product at the end of it. Um, yeah, the final thing that's just be honest about what risks you have. Um, state your assumptions and make those off axis more um, relatable to the design. You know, there's the, the guide has some typical ones in there, but you know, once you do a couple of them, you ideal panel probably got a feel of what future weather's gonna do, but what's more valuable saying like actually this this building's got opening windows like this with no control to the local systems what is that risk you know just just help them understand what risks there are and to say how we're going to mitigate it right, I'll, I'll lost it again sort of moving the mouse. right so a little case study now how much time have i got um, um, we're on no, okay so this is a project called Soapworks in Bristol. Um, and I've worked on Bristol schemes. Hands up, one. So if you don't know, Bristol has got a 
district heat system, partly sourced by CHP. I think they've got a water source heat pump now. They're trying to decarbonize it. Anyway, yada, yada, yada. They've got a district heat system. Neighbours in Australia, I don't believe from experience, really has any district heating schemes. Like the guidance doesn't really line up to large scale district heating schemes. Um, so how the complications that has faced, bringing it over to the UK market, um, yeah, it, it was quite challenging. And this is why. Oh. <laughs> so this is the project, this is block A. This is the office building and block C is also an office building. We're working on block A, we got appointed for the MEP design and neighbors on block A, and then block C, we're just doing some light refurb work, some light MEP strategy, a couple of radiators, maybe some fan coil units. But we're just assessing block A for neighbors, that's the showpiece, big, nice building. Um, from the start, it says he comes to the Bristol Heat Network, there's a connection with block A, and there's a connection with block B. Perfect, there'll be a meter for block A, and then there'll be a meter for block C, independent effect. I just need the meter reading for block A from the heat. Happy days. What then actually transpires is it's all within block A. So all of this digital heat connection is in block A. We've then got the utility meter in block A, and then there's two branches. One goes off to do block A, and then another one goes off to do block C. All metered. You'd think happy or fine for neighbours, and fundamentally you're you're all right. You've got the net, you've got the, the meter information, but if you want to get through the IDR process, they're just going to flag this as a massive risk. What if these fail? I mean, they're still on meters; they're always going to fail. So, what is the risk that these will have on your block A energy rating? Because if these fail, you're taking all this energy into your block A rating because there's no physical separation. Um, so that meant the only way that we could de-risk it is to say, well, here's an idea of how much energy block C will use. Um, and of course, what that means is you've then got to simulate block C in the same detail as you simulated block A. Did we have the fee for that? Do we have the scope? No. Was it identified at the start? Like no. Some scary phases on that. <laughs> so this is this is part of the problem. Like, make sure you know the fundamentals right you know if there's a district key what connections you have do you have any shared services flag those issues early on because otherwise you're going to be caught potentially modeling one if not 10 other buildings which you know could happen nearly yeah. happened um so that was doing the heat and then later in the design mep come to us say due to space constraints Block C cooling is now provided by the chillers on block A. Uh, don't worry, we've got a meter and we'll exclude the energy. Fine, yeah, that's all good for neighbours. But again, what is the risk to your neighbours rating? What is that, what is that impact going to have on your prediction of the energy that block A use and then the neighbours rating that you'll get? A neighbour states quite specifically that, you know, the simulation should reflect the central plant loads. Plant on block A is in block A and block C. All the energy, block A chillers, is on the block A meter. We want to exclude stuff, but the efficiency of that system is dependent on the load it sees. So our model has got to expand. And this is, again, based the problem. We need to expand the model without the scope, without the fee, just to get through the IDR, because otherwise, who knows what the impact is. So. Well, that in summary, so yeah, be cautious about what you're going into. Make sure you know the principles right, um, and yeah, have a review of the design before you launch into the modeling and check the scope to make sure that you've got. The right. Probably that the point we're discussing today about that this can actually be extended, and like having retail units within your development that actually you know fed by the same system. So it's not just the heated system; it's effectively. Yeah, yeah. So that's one thing I didn't mention. So Block C also has a retail unit, and that might open on the weekend. No one can tell us. The developer just wants to keep it open. You know, oh, we haven't decided what retailers coming in. But then, as Alex mentioned, the chillers are Block A, big old units, you know, 500 kilowatts or something. On the weekend, they've got to fire up to do a tiny little retail unit down here. Why? It wasn't identified early on. I mean, I, we actually got direct flight in the end. They all went to an RF system, but 
we have seen that on other projects where a retail unit fed from a main system, no one can tell us when it will actually operate. And lo and behold, they want Saturday, Sunday operation. So, I think that's it. Thank you, Rowan. Okay, so just to reiterate the purpose of modeling, particularly for design for performance purposes, this really needs to reflect the true and likely operation of the building as closely as possible at the specific design stage here, what you're looking at. As has been covered by Owen, this really can requires a considerable well, sorry, mm -hmm. a considerable amount of work, time and thought beyond the modelling carried out traditionally for regulatory purposes, with an awareness of what the limitations might be in the context of the specific project. The advanced modelling within this in mind can then later be used for benchmarking and monitoring purposes. What commonly seems to have been overlooked in many of the initial projects um, is the significant additional value, which again Owen has nicely also touched upon. Um, and initial modelling or modelling in later stages can add to really influence and inform the ongoing design decisions, as I'll aim to expand upon. Okay, so in some of these initial cases, this might be due to the late implementation of the process and commencement of modelling at later design stages. Um, often under very significant time pressure. This is certainly being true for us and many of the projects we have looked at. But it's again highlight given the time and cost of modeling, the potential for this to drive the ultimate success of the project. This could be a significant lost opportunity, which should really not be overlooked in fi helping find the most appropriate solutions in the context of the project and analyze how best to mitigate against specific risks, communicating them to the wider team prior to the decisions being finalised and crystallised as part of the ongoing design. So to touch upon some of the examples of this value which are overlooked. Um, by some of the projects we've seen. Firstly, the depth of analysis, given the context of the specific information which goes into the modelling or early stage analysis should really give a better indication of the demands which will likely be placed on the building's um, services and plan. These can be used to better understand the capacities which are truly necessary, clearly when plan is sized more closely to the specific project requirements, as in the project demands shown at the bottom left, and not oversized as we've seen in some of the outputs from the initial projects we've looked at, as well as in more traditional design. Um, this can yield significant savings to areas such as capital costs and embodied carbon beyond efficiency and control implications alone. As a side note, it is critical that the actual capacity specified, minimum turndown, and accurate performance curves are accurately modelled in the design for performance work. Without this, modelling will not only not reflect the likely outcome and the detriment to efficiency. That running plant units at low load may have, it will also significantly limit the value of the modelling when looking at the implications of alternative options. So going beyond sizing in isolation, there's a lot of value in, in analysing the likely dynamic demands to be met by the building systems. By doing so we, and looking at details such as how will out of hours loads be met, likely at very significant turndown, as in the case of um, Owen's project with the retail units. Um, sorry. Or what will the balance of heating and cooling requirements be? Can provide significant detail to inform decisions such as how, will, how much thermal, thermal storage should be incorporated? How could this be used? And what are the implications of the wider control strategy adopted? what plant might be best suited to meeting this load profile. As quite a superficial example, which a lot of detail can be built into, um, 
we saw for some of the initial um, projects for for pipe um, SLC pumps being used in isolation, when these might not always be the best um, the best choice for the context. These can be very efficient meeting simultaneous heating and cooling demands, as shown by the central efficiency profile. But in the highly cooling dominated case shown at the bottom left, this might not be the best solution where two pipe units or an even more efficient solution can be specified in combination with these to much more efficiently meet the specific cooling requirements while still recovering a usable level of heat, which would otherwise be rejected by the building specific requirements. I thought it might also be worth touching on the controls aspect, given how key it is to the success of the building and operation, as, as has also been touched upon. And how frequently it seems to be, there seem to be disparities, if only minor, um, between what has been modelled and what has actually been proposed in the BMS control documentation, description of, of operations or otherwise. Um, hopefully these are formalised somewhere. This also hasn't always been the case which is critical to understand how the building, the design intent of the building and how it will already be operated. So how the controls operate and the impact of these can have significant interdependency and a significant range of impact or potential risk dependent on the context and how they, they're applied. As a result, and how Owen has also touched upon here, modeling can provide significant insight as the value and what the best strategies might be. I've chosen natural ventilation as a quick example to highlight some of the issues, given that there can be such a range of how this is incorporated or controlled, or not as the case may be, and also accounting for how this interoperates with central systems. Each of the choices may introduce risks in operation, critically for natural ventilation. Could the controls fail or windows be left open in colder conditions, leading to significant additional heating consumption? And what are the mechanisms which can or will be implemented to reduce the likelihood and consequences associated with this? We ourselves have been looking at recommissioning some of the mixed mode buildings we previously helped design and are putting in significant work to find optimal controls, which will now work in the context of these projects, given that natural ventilation now has much more potential to meet the reduced cooling demands required due to obviously reduced lighting and equipment loads, which were typical of operation 10 years ago. All the projects we have looked at, these are some of the points which the design teams face, and are surprisingly frequently overlooked to ensure that simulation not simply meets the objective of predicting um, true operation, but influences and adds value to the ongoing design. I'll now hand over to Claire, who will talk a bit more about the simulation and how this can be improved. Um, so I'm going to talk, as, um, yeah. So as you mentioned, talk about how simulation and simulation reports in particular can be improved. So I'm Claire Dasbovic from Inclin, um, simulation consultant, and um, on the ideal path. Um, so for those that aren't familiar with the neighbours IDR process, when we carry out the IDR, we don't actually look at the model. We only see the simulation report. So the simulation report is a crucial document and all the information about the model needs to be within that report. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is um, thermal comfort. So there needs to be some um, consideration in the report about thermal comfort. And it, we need to have confidence that this has been considered so that the model is um, operating as it would in real life. So we need to put the right correct size of systems in the model. We need to put the correct um, occupants and lighting and so on. But we also need to have the correct result in internal conditions. So if we don't have the right internal conditions, the space is too cold or too hot in actual practice, that building is going to use more energy to um, either heat the space or cool the space and create the nice comfortable conditions for the occupants. So the um, what we recommend is um, an unmet hours table, something like this as an example. Um, this is itemised by zone. Um, this is something that's very easy to do in IES. Um, I've experienced IES. I've been told that it's more tricky to do in TAS. Um, 
but other people I'd love to hear if anyone knows how you create something like this as after we finish talking um but I think they can in TAS produce a report on a whole building basis which gives the number of zones which are outside of the um, comfort bands or the set point bands and this can be acceptable on a whole building basis as long as the modeler then identifies where these zones are and um, why and when they occur. And yeah, so I've already mentioned unmet hours are a risk to the design because obviously they might lead to additional energy, so they might mm -hmm. shut your rate. Yes. So PV is another um, area. Um, maybe not so significant in all buildings, but if you do have any hours where you're exporting energy, this needs to be excluded. So what the modeler needs to do is to, on an hourly basis, look at the energy generated by the PV and the energy used by the building and compare the two. And if there's any excess generation, this needs to be excluded from the total of PV. And this is only really probably going to affect um, kind of out of office, sorry, out of office, out of town kind of developments which have a larger floor plate or larger footprint rather and a larger roof area where they have a significant size of PV. Off axis scenarios, you've heard them mentioned a few times already, but these are really critical to neighbours because they quantify what would actually happen when things go wrong in various scenarios. So these, um, as I think Owen mentioned earlier, need to be um, the choice of these will depend on your actual building, what's in your building, what's installed. So there's not a set list that needs to be included. It really depends on your building, but they do need to have substantial effect on the rating. So we'd expect the modeler to test various scenarios and to include in the report those which are significant risk to the rating and then quantify that. Also, the report needs to include all the information about the effects of scenario. So what inputs have been changed in order to create that scenario? So quite often we see that um, the off axis scenarios are not that well defined. So all the set points that have been changed or um, which flaws are affected in the off axis scenarios need to be all detailed in the report. So controls, um, again, we've had controls mentioned and any any place in the building or in the model sorry, where there are controls applied, this needs to be detailed in the report. So I've given an example here, which is a um, CO2 control of the ventilation pressure and it shows the ground part from um, the different CO2 ppm um, values in the office space. So we need to include in the report the turn downs, the set points, and the various functions that are used. And finally, other loads. So, also mentioned earlier, um, we need to include everything in the building that's included within the scope of the neighbour's rating. <clears throat> so, this will include for a base building or a whole building rating, this will include all of the landlord spaces, and some of these might not be that significant but um, for example if you have a basement plant room you can have quite high ventilation rates and these can often be 24 7 loads so they can actually be quite significant and make a difference to the rating um, also just to mention trace heating and switchboard and reticulation losses um, so i'm going to hand back now to darren to um, wrap up there's a very big thing that i don't there was a lot of preparation for today's presentation and I had a lot of meetings with, with all of them. One thing that stuck with me was that you and engineers were actually, you know, we did have a note. We know the project we're working on. We know a lot of details, you know, but we always forget the people outside of our bubble don't know anything about the project. So we need to ensure that we need we include everything in the report. For simple things like location, orientation, floor plans, because as you know, Claire said, they don't know anything about the building, they don't have the model, they're getting all the information from you. So it's really, really important that we, you know, we include as much as we can in the report. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, if there's enough information in the reports, uh, it will probably be coming back with, um, with some comments to 
to help us understand building perhaps a little bit better. But you probably picked up from that that, that IDRs are quite analytical people. Um, so, <laughs> yes, well, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, like 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 everyone else, we're uh, our job is, and if we do it well, is to to find um, potential areas where the building won't perform, uh, and to inform and try and help that become resolved so that you get the target that you want. Because ultimately, what we want is to get some really good rated neighbours buildings out there. Um, so, I think. I probably talk for everyone when, and I've been on, I think we've probably all been on the receiving end of having your work criticised. And so a lot of people see the IDR as being that process. Um, and it's very easy, once we've issued the IDR back, you get a few rounds of actually resolving those issues, getting it back. And if those issues aren't resolved to um, the right level of satisfaction, then it would usually result in a derating. And we would usually be able to work out what those risks are and advise what that derating would be. And then uh, it would go to um, the BRE as it is now. Um, essentially, and that would be what your rating is. If you work with the IDR, so if you take that IDR and you detach emotion and you try and understand what the IDR is saying, and if you still don't understand why he's coming back or she's coming back with this feedback, talk to them and understand why you've got this feedback and what you need to do about it. Because in the text boxes we get to fill out, you know, there can always be a bit of a conversation about maybe uh, it was intended to be designed something differently uh, and it's come across differently in the, uh, um, in the design documents that come across. In which case that would change from a potential problem with the building to a potential problem with how it's been written down effectively. So, um, IDR, you want to take it once the design is complete, but if you appoint the IDR early and you get your simulations done early, do a free IDR, because then you can get a lot of these things ticked off early at the point that you can get them um, get them changed. Um, and also unmet hours, yeah, really important one. Uh, we don't see all projects with them, but it is a requirement that you do unmet hours. Also consider it like just a bit of a check that actually your design is working because Sometimes we get on my hours and they are like 10% out. It's like, well, hang on, that's not going to be comfortable. So, yeah, it's, it, use it as well as a, a bit of a check for your, your own models. So, but for the element hours, do you have like a sweet spot in terms of percentage of how much that could be off? Or you uh, there is guidance on what the percentage is. I think it's about 2% max, but it's going to be the criteria, but as, as minimal as possible. Yeah. yeah. Usually, if I get lots of zeros, I get suspicious. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Sorry, I was going to ask this at the end. Um, but could you just elaborate a little bit more on what unmet hours are for someone who's not quite as techy as the majority of people in the room? Yes. That's, so I know Sarah did explain. I didn't quite pick it up. Yeah. When when you undertake the model, um, your your neighbour's model should have plant in the building to the size that it has been designed at. So when you're doing your model, you don't press auto size. You actually input the sizes of the plant, and then it's using that plant with the timing information that you've put in the controls to heat the building or cool the building. So the unmet towers is essentially where spaces are not achieving their design temperatures within a certain bound. OK, yeah, that's uh, Right, so some closing remarks were already there, weren't we? So a uh, bit of a scheme update. Uh, those who know neighbours probably heard that the BRE has chosen to terminate their agreement to administrate it in the UK. Um, I just thought it was worth touching on this very briefly. So Neighbours UK is still owned by uh, Neighbours Australia. So it's governed by Neighbours Australia. The BRE simply administrates it in the UK or administer it in the UK for Neighbours. So there are uh, expressive in interests uh, out there at the moment, which if you are interested in being the administrator, you need to get your expressive interest back by the 3rd of November to uh, Neighbours in Australia. We don't expect the scheme to change because it's very much built around the neighbour scheme in Australia. Um, the, the rules and everything that's come out is, is, is all part of a collective group of the steering committee, which will move with the administration. Um, and we do expect Neighbours UK to grow into other building types like they do in, in Australia, including um, uh, hotels, data centres and, and other areas. So we do expect the scheme to continue to grow. Um, if 
you uh, would like to uh, do a course to understand how to model for neighbours. This is the advanced simulation modeling for dynamic for design for performance. This is a software agnostic course. It doesn't teach you how to use software. It teaches you how to model for neighbours. So there's all sorts of information in this course around um, uh, uh, the rules, um, how to do the right kind of feed posts and allow enough time, how to put the simulation report together and all those aspects. So it's all more theory based and completely software agnostic in how to actually model for neighbours and prepare your simulation report. Um, I wrote part of this course um, with Delta Q um, and Burko, uh, and it was funded by SIPSI in terms of putting it together a few years ago. Uh, and yeah, search for that on the SIPSI training website if you would like to uh, uh, okay. do the course. I think you say it's the next one? Um, it's going to be next year sometime. Yeah, uh, there are dates, but they haven't been confirmed by SIPSI yet because someone has to be available to kind of set the online thing up. Yes. Uh, any yeah. any questions? I can keep half with one, so to the yeah. you might as well come up. Yes. And go over there. Also, people in the chat can put your questions over there if you have any questions. Um have you well it's very fun, but have you seen any of the projects you have either reviewed or modeled uh, achieving the performance rating? And if not, have you gone back to the additional modeling to see what the issues are? Any of you? Or at, other you? At design stage or yeah. like building, achieving it when it's in, in it's real practice. In real practice, yes. Uh, I think we're at early stages here yeah, in yeah. terms of um, the buildings that we've been through and done IDRs on actually being completed and achieved a four years energy use. Um, I think it's probably fair to say, and what we've learned from Australia is um, that first year. Uh, you might be unlikely to get your target rating. It's then how you work to get your building back to where it should be performing. Um, one of the great things about Neighbours is actually, it means that we start to look and make sure the building is working how, how we designed it, um, which is something we just don't do. You know, it's very much the way our building regulations and other things work. We finish when we hand the building over, and it's a completely different team who don't necessarily have knowledge of how it works, whereas the Neighbours process is starting to put all these together. But yeah, it's going to be interesting when we start to get some of that information mm. back. At the back? Yeah. Um, you don't have yeah, so in the spirit of monitoring, do you guys, have any of you engaged with the iSCUM software from IES? So you know, like digital twins to have the ongoing monitoring when it's in operation? Uh, yes. We played with it. Yeah. I haven't taken further than that. Okay. <laughs> Is anyone from IS in? Uh, no. Good. Yeah, it was negative. Uh, it was one exactly wonderful. It's really <laughs> I think you're but in, in reality, once you get the building in use, you're not gonna have the eye scan software, I don't believe, linking to the energy data. That that, that is possible. Yeah, it, it is, but we've tried to do it and okay. we couldn't get it to work. Um, we had a trial software to do it. It might have improved. I'm not going to comment. Like it is possible, but I think what we're starting to do uh, on projects is actually um, scope in or design a bespoke monitoring system. So you can see real life neighbors rating or you know neighbors rating or how energy is tracking against model against the actual operation of the building. So it's more embedded within. A separate smart monitoring system rather than using an eye scan, eye scan software. But it, like fundamentally, it, it's doing the good thing for neighbors where you can see the real life building compared mm -hmm. against the simulated output. And then, yeah, you can use it to play around with the model. But yeah. All right. I'll, I'll take one from the chat first and I'll go back to back. So, I would for, it's for the idea, I guess. But uh, regarding thermal comfort checks, should we not look at operative temperatures instead of air temperatures on the towers since comfort is determined by operative temperatures, not just air temperatures? Um, no, because we're looking at whether the systems are performing as they should, whether the controls are performing as they should. That's my take on it. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so generally, yes, it, we're seeing if the controls are working correctly and the controls are sensing air temperature and humidity if we're measuring humidity. So generally, 
if your system is controlling to a set point of an air temperature, then we need the unlit out of sun to air temperature. The only time we would use operative temperature is when we're operating in mixed mode, because then actually we are working to an operative's operation of a window, um, which we go to into in some detail in, in the course. Um, we're kind of in uncharted territory in that because in Australia, they tend not to do mixed mode buildings, um, but we seem to be doing more and more of them and they're having good results on neighbours. So um, we're watching that closely to make sure that they actually do. Okay. At the back then? Yeah. Okay. Hello. Right. Um, hi. Uh, you mentioned quite well, you put quite an emphasis on fine tuning the systems and knowing how the building works and um, and maximizing the efficiencies. And from what I've gathered, uh, it's the um, IC, uh, the base building model when you're doing your neighbors excludes ICT, small power and lighting. So there is a kind of a risk of disjoint between your loads, floor plate loads and, and that. So how would you tackle the risk of not meeting performance criteria where those three items are excessive, say. You want to take I'll go, I'll go. So you, they are excluded from your neighbor's base building rating, but it doesn't mean you exclude them from your model. You put them in there. So you model the whole building, and then you can also, neighbor's gives you some defaults for internal gains where you just don't know, you know, some bits of small power you put in the lighting, but you don't know what the fit out is going to be. So again, that's what the off-axis is for. You can use the neighbor's defaults. Trader floors is quite you know, a common one that we've seen to use as an off-axis scenario because it's going to be very intensive energy use. Or, you know, a sort of loose fit out, low occupancy kind of thing. You can play around with it, but I don't see it as a risk because it's always in there and you use the off-axis to see what the impact is. If your occupancy goes up or down. IVR, anybody else? Um, yeah, no, I'd say that's um, a very good summary. I'd, I'd say also for some of the buildings which um, we've looked at, there seems to be a risk of tenancies using some areas out of hours, and mechanisms to manage that and the risk can be really important. And again, you can test that uh, kind of sensitivity in your modelling as well. I think the other thing to bear in mind is that if you do have high loads, there's probably a reason for that. So if you have high server loads because you have a, the tenant has a server room that's serving other buildings, then you start to get into the areas that you can actually exclude. So you would need to separately meet to that if you're providing it from the main plant, and you could exclude that load because it's an excludable aspect of neighbours. Uh, if you have high loads because you have a high occupancy, then that would go into the factoring of how the neighbours is calculated. So there are mechanisms to accommodate where those high loads are valid but not where those highlights are not valid purely because the tenant isn't correctly operating their space. Okay, I, I'm not sure. Can I have another question? Go for it. Welcome, Darren. Um, the lady mentioned about the photovoltaics and that, and I think on one statement it was that photovoltaics are in general excluded, and the second statement was that the excess of power generated is excluded. So, which one is it? Yeah, so basically um, your model or um, your PV consultant, um, whatever, calculates your annual PV um, yield. So we're at the design stage. We, we predict what the yield is going to be. And then that is subtracted from your building load because you're offsetting that energy. So it is, they are included. So in general, that's the case. That's where your PV is not exported any any energy only exported energy is exported exported energy is not subtracted from your rated your um building energy to get your rated energy because it's it's not actually contributing to reducing your energy in the building does that make sense yeah so i think the terminology is a bit confusing sorry yeah i think uh, the, the graph that claire put up uh, shows it quite nicely. So if, if this is your load during uh, a weekday and this is your PV, then you're going to be including all the power. But if at the weekend, this is your base loads, then this part here that you're going to export and you can't include that. Right. Thank you. I have a follow-up question on PV. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Dad. 
So if I've got a big PV array and I've got a big load, do I have to track to see is all that PV energy used by the landlord? Or yeah. <coughs> yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> Darren. I've got a demand side question. Um, so from I think probably for Darren, from um Australia, is there any what is the evidence about the value, perhaps uh, asset value, rentable value, other value from um, doing these types of studies? And then parallel to that in the UK, what's the current marketing strategy? What does the future look like for Neighbours UK and beyond voluntary? Uh, that, I mean, that's a uh, very good bunch of questions. Um, so I'm trying to remember back to when we were putting together the arguments for the neighbours in the UK. Essentially, in Australia, it has shown that buildings with good rating let for more. Yeah, tenants want them. Occupiers want to have a green building. So high-rated buildings are letting for quite significantly more money. Um, in the UK, what we're seeing is um, it, it's all part of that um, CSR. Corporate responsibility. People are doing neighbours because it really demonstrates they're making a proper commitment to uh, closing that performance gap um, and building buildings that actually perform and can be proven to perform. So uh, I think when it was first launched, it was a little bit quiet, wasn't it? But I mean, now it's, it's taking off like nothing else. We're getting lots of, of IDRs through, lots of inquiries through. Um, the actual rating of buildings is happening, but it's not a mandatory disclosure. So you can have your building rated if it's in use now um, by the neighbours scheme. Um, in terms of where it's going, there, there was a consultation a few years ago, which some may remember, which was around using neighbours as a mandatory rating system in the UK. Uh, I think essentially it's proven just to be a little bit early for that. Um, but it hasn't been, um, it's been paused, nothing more than that, as far as I'm aware. So there is always that potentially on the horizon as it becoming um, like a, a mandatory uh, rating and disclosure system. Um, I'm not going to say name and shame, but it will certainly uh, push the majority to do a rating over a certain square meterage size that is mm. to, uh, to do that neighbor's rating. My comment will be yes, please. Let's get rid of EPC. But anyway, um, I'll get to questions from the chat. Uh, so the first one, how does neighbours uh, suit in with T54, which appears to be more comprehensive and therefore of more use to the end user? Yes, so T54, um, of which I was one of the con contributors of the last one, uh, essentially neighbours is recognised in there as one of the methodologies. So if you ask to do a TM54 study, you get a number of different methods that you can use to undertake that operational energy and estimation. Um, and Neighbours is actually in there as one of those, those <laughs> options. Okay. And second one is, is there a plan to increase the size of the IVR panel? I, I expect so, <laughs> yes. We, so the IDRs, believe it or not, um, even though you know we uh, only one of us can do your building. How many are you? Ten. Ten. Um, so some of them aren't in the UK. Eleven. eleven. Sorry, eleven. Yes, yeah. I think two are outside the two. Is it? Yeah, two in Australia. Um, we meet quite regularly. Um, we talk about um, not sorry projects, but experiences um, and workload, and we meet with the administrator. So at the point that that um, we can't go anymore, they will bring more IDRs. I'd also maybe make the comment that if neighbours gets expanded, as in Australia, Australia's so other building types, there might be people who can bring in significantly more experience yeah. in the panel. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Quick, quick one for me. Do we know which one is the next one coming? No. Mm -hmm. um, so some... I think, uh, who was next, possibly? Hi, people from chat with BDSB. Um, post IDR, uh, if there are design changes, as there are tolerance to what would mean redoing the IDR process and what wouldn't. So um, I don't think you necessarily need to redo the IDR process unless you need unless you redo the, the design. Yeah. Um, say changes in the core. Yeah. So that would be something that you would consider as part of the rating achievement plan. So when you put the rating achievement plan together, you would consider how those changes would be managed. So if those changes, for example, um, potentially risk uh, 
the neighbour's rating, but, uh, and it goes off to be a design and construct project, you may need to require the contractor to redo the simulation model to prove that your neighbour's rating has not been affected. Ben? I'll take more questions. Any, <laughs> any thoughts? No, I don't think so. Ben? Yeah, um, yeah, question of the panel. Have you seen it? it's changed um, both engineers and clients' view to risk? As in engineering, Eve, we would be risk averse to undersize. So we would traditionally put in an extra chiller, put in a slightly bigger boiler. Whereas obviously a neighbor's may change that, that approach. Um, no, not yet. <laughs> no, it's, 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 we are, we're working on it because um, there's like some examples of this, like hot water flow temperatures of 70 degrees. And um, yeah, there is some resistance and oversizing of systems. Hopefully, yeah, we, we get there. <laughs> I think the, the, what, the one thing I've noticed is um, in terms of diversity to risk is actually some buildings just throwing everything at it. You know, every kind of green technology possible. Uh, as, as was mentioned, you know, just going full out with four pipe um, chillers when actually your simultaneous load isn't full load, yeah. uh, that kind of thing. So, yeah, it, it, it is about being sensible about it. And uh, I don't think we've necessarily seen that effect yet. Hopefully it's coming. I think you can also make it work for your project. So the peak size is always going to be there for the foreseeable, but how you meet that peak size is up to you. But you could, instead of having three identical sized heat pumps, which you see quite often, why not have one smaller one, a medium or a larger, whatever. So you can kind of think more about what different make of a plant can meet that load and match it to your predicted operational load. Now, implementing that is obviously tricky, but getting that thought process is, you know, uh, we're starting to do it, we're starting to advise for it, to implement it is always going to be challenging. But And, and City is starting to look at, um, or rather volunteers within City are starting to look at the dynamic sizing of plant rather than steady state. Um, so if you've got experience in doing that, then come and chat. So we'll go to the bike and then to the front. It was just really an addition to what Ben was saying. We are seeing some of it. Actually, on our screens to reduce the size of to better meet the expected loads rather than what would have been traditional BCO loads. So we are putting in smaller time and modularizing it, but it is all about having a sensible conversation with the fine and early stages and more importantly, the various agents that are on the market, because they seem to be driving the expectations of how a building is going to be sized and then what the form. Yeah, you know, getting it ready can be done. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, out every minute. <laughs> I was just going to ask from your experience um, are there any key risks or limitations during the design for performance model stage when you are uh, designing it? Because obviously, at the end of uh, whatever one is to make it resemble the actual operation as accurately as possible. My follow up question is. Are there any external factors as well that maybe go into the modeling of the building? So. Um, yeah, that's that's a really difficult question because there's so many potential kind of external variables which um, could impact that. I'd, I'd say the guidance is actually really good in that respect. So it, it talks mm -hmm. about things like commissioning um, incoming tenants. And as part of your work, you're going to be looking at the, the rating achievement plan with your client to try and look at how to manage some of that risk. If, if that answers your question, I don't know if you wanted to ask something a bit more specific. Well, kind of, but I was just thinking, I don't know if that completely falls into the scope of neighbors, but I was just thinking of uh, simple things like, you know, your moderates uh, or some specific uh, type of seasons as well, the thermal uh, modeling approach. But what about nowadays, what we're seeing is with unexpected hot summers or hot winters, like things like that, because that will probably severely uh, affect the neighbors rating as well. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, well, that's that's a, <laughs> there would normally be an off-axis scenario in future weather at least. Um, so we would generally expect, I mean, we got good future weather files from SIBSI, so these would be used to um, look at the future weather. Generally things are getting hotter. Um, outside of that, um, I guess you could put various off-axis scenarios in. Um, 
Yeah, I'd, I'd say also if you're modeling, you have a re really unique perspective given all the work you've done on the project as to the actual specific risks. So, yeah. So yeah. basically, just from my understanding right now, it doesn't really calculate those things into the Davis rating, does so everyone? Yeah, so the, I mean, the Davis rating. Generally, what we advise at the moment is that when you do your, your bank's name is probably needs to be the TRY data because you know, that's a reliable source of your data. Um, you do need to have off access scenarios, though, typically for hot, hot weather future scenarios. Uh, and it's quite interesting in when building is, is placed, also it seems to have an influence on the outcome of that, um, which is quite interesting. Um, but effectively, though, as, as we start to get hotter as a country, the factors within the neighbor's calculation will change to, to allow for that, that additional energy use. So we are kind of expecting um, to a certain extent that to be absorbed, but also it's worth considering that when you do those off-access scenarios, you'll notice that some buildings are affected more than others through that changing weather scenario. So it's quite interesting about how it allows buildings are allowing themselves to be influenced or not influenced, and it's worth really thinking around you know what you can do to to isolate those those events. Um, bit mindful of time, so I'm just going to get, get the last one. I don't know what to say. I'm going to get the last one, and after that we can stay around with our more drinks in the fridge. And we're going to put out Ben right, so we can stay and ask more questions to the panel also. So yes. And um, yes, yeah, so thank you. That's a really great series of presentation. Um, it's interesting to get your insights and see you know, what the industry is going to be doing. So we've got a lot of people who are doing simulation, learning how to do design performance and foreign names guidance. And eventually these buildings will be built, they'll be fitted out, they'll be tenanted and in operation. So we're developing new skills about doing the DFP modeling at this stage. What do you think will be sort of new skills for simulators when we get to that point where the buildings are being operated? With fine tuning and optimizing or troubleshooting, what sort of new skills do you think that the simulators will be needing to sort of develop in as that part of the process? So you'll probably move into the rounds of a performance engineer, pretty much. And the skills you need to learn is how to read the building energy management system. They're all a bit different, they're all a bit complex, they might be bespoke ones. Um, but the main aim of it will be, you know, go into a building, figure out. How is this building occupied? How can I, you know, it's been half leased out, it might be used on the weekend. Are they on track for their neighbors rating, for example? So you'd want to take your, your BMS data or your energy data, you then could tweak your energy model and then line them up. But if you aren't able to do either one of those, mm. then you know, who is who's going to be able to make, to give the certainty to a developer or a client that yeah, you're on track, the building is performing as expected, but it's controls. Or, or you know, plant sizing, or when the plant's coming on, for example. For example. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think um, in the short term, what we're expecting is members of the design team actually to be carried across into the operational stages, so that um, effectively that design knowledge um, and for the model metering and output relatively reflect the metering of the building, so that you can start to see where it is right. Um, no doubt it might be quite a lot, but you can start to see where you need to bring uh, your energy back. Um, we start to see, interestingly, some resistance from some design teams to actually be involved, and others are very interested in being involved. So um, we need more of the latter to be kind of passionate and want to know how their buildings that they're designing are performing. And I'm hoping that this scheme will help to, um, to encourage that. Thank you all. Thank you very much for your very meaningful insights.